Revelation chapter number 1, we'll read verse 8. The Bible says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That's so good, I want to read it again. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless your holy name. We're thankful, Lord, for the name above every name, the name of Jesus. Lord, you recorded in your word that at one day, and someday in the future, and I believe the near future, every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords uh, and King of Kings. Uh, Lord, you're already Lord, uh, but one day everybody's going to proclaim that you're Lord. Even Satan himself will bow before you. Amen. And Lord, we bless your holy name. Glad I, God, I'm glad for the day you came to where I was. Uh, showed me my lost condition, uh, but showed me you'd save me if I'd call on you. Uh, God, I'm glad religion doesn't save. Uh, I'm glad, Lord, that uh, man doesn't save. Uh, but I'm glad Jesus saves. Uh, and I'm glad you came to save uh, uh, that which was lost. Uh, now, Father, I pray you'd help us this morning for a few minutes uh, I pray you'd sit down amongst us. Uh, you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, I pray as Brother Doug's already prayed, uh, you'd set a table before us. Uh, Lord, I know one thing. When a table is set, uh, it does nobody any good unless they pull up a seat underneath it uh, and begin to partake of what uh, is on the table. Uh, Father, I pray we'd have a bunch of partakers around here today. Uh, they'd want to feast from the things of God. Uh, Father, I pray if there be any amongst us today uh, doesn't know how to feast because they don't know the Lord, uh, I pray today be the day of their salvation. Uh, I pray for the children of God. Uh, no doubt they've faced many things in the past few days, uh, but Lord, I pray today they'd put all that out of their mind. Uh, they'd just enjoy the Lord. Uh, I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel. Uh, and I pray you'd bless as only you can. Uh, Put a hedge about us. Bind the powers of the devil. Uh, God, I pray you just speak. Uh, do something supernatural and unusual in our midst. Uh, Father, we'll bless you and praise you for it. Uh, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we do pray. Uh, amen. Uh, Amen. Uh, I want you to notice some things about this verse. Uh, 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 we find in this verse uh, the period uh, of God's reign. Uh, look what he said. Uh, he said, I am Alpha and Omega. Uh, can I say he's been God from eternity past uh, and he'll be God uh, to eternity future. Uh, there'll never be a time when he isn't God. Uh, there's never been a time he hasn't been God. Uh, he's always been God. Uh, he's God today. Uh, he's God if you like it or don't like it. Uh, he is God. Uh, and we see from Alpha Omega, uh, the beginning and the ending, he's always been God. I bless the Lord. Uh, he's on the throne today. Uh, we see the period of his reign, uh, uh, but we also see the presence of his reign. Uh, he said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. But look what he says, uh, uh, which is uh, and which was uh, and which is to come. Uh, there's never been anybody that's breathed God's air. God uh, uh, was it present. Uh, he's the omnipresent God. Uh, he's always been present. Uh, he said he was present, uh, uh, which is, which is right now, uh, which was, which was always, uh, and which is to come. He always will be present. Uh, I bless the Lord. 
God. We don't always see him. We don't always feel him. But friend, there's never a time he's not there. I'm glad he's the present God. Hey, he's not in the grave today. He's not sitting on a rocking chair trying to figure out what's going on. I'm glad where two or three are gathered together in his name, he'll be in the midst. He's with us here. Hey, I'm glad he lives in me. Whithersoever I go, he goes with me. I bless the Lord. He's a present God. He's a present and help in time of need. Uh, no wonder David cried, I'll look unto the hills uh, from whence cometh my help. Uh, my help cometh from the Lord. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, we see the period of his reign. Uh, we see the presence of his reign. Uh, but notice the power of his reign. Uh, he says, uh, the uh, Almighty. Uh, uh, the Bible said in Revelation 19 6, uh, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, uh, and as the voice of might, many waters, uh, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, uh, saying, Hallelujah, uh, for the Lord God omnipotent uh, reigneth. Uh, hey, we find he is almighty. Uh, he's not lost one ounce of his power, uh, he's just as powerful as he's always always been uh, and he has the power to help you and I what a blessing uh, and for just a few minutes uh, I want to focus where it says the almighty uh, and I want to preach uh, on this thought uh, God uh, Almighty. Uh, hey, some of you come in this morning uh, walking on your lower lip. Uh, maybe you're serving a small G God. Uh, I've got good news. Uh, we have God Almighty. Uh, and if you'll just get a hold of Him this morning, uh, it'll change your perspective. Uh, it'll change your life. Uh, what a blessing that God Almighty uh, is even here uh, in our midst today. Uh, you say, tell me something about God Almighty. Almighty. Uh, well, let me say this about him. Uh, he's the incomparable God. Uh, uh, the Bible says in Isaiah 40 and 18, uh, to whom will you liken God? Uh, or what likeness will you compare unto him? Uh, there is no comparison uh, when it comes to God. Uh, there's nothing that can match him. Uh, nothing that can challenge him. Uh, nothing that comes close to him. Uh, you think of the greatest of the greatest. Uh, and they're far beneath his feet. Uh, his throne is in the sides of the north. Uh, everything is below him. Uh, he's incomparable. Uh, there's not enough adjectives to describe him. Uh, there's not enough ink and pens to write about him. Uh, there's not enough notes and songs to sing about him. Uh, he's incomparable. Uh, he's the great God uh, that reached down to the lowest hell uh, and redeemed sinners. Uh, Hey, he's the one uh, who reached down to that pit you were in uh, and pulled you up and set your feet on a rock, uh, put song of praise of God in your mouth uh, and set you on your way. Uh, there's nobody like him. Uh, only God uh, can take a sinner uh, and make a saint out of him. Uh, only God uh, uh, can change uh, uh, the vilest uh, and make him uh, uh, clean and pure uh, and a joy to be around. Uh, he's the incomparable God. Uh, you can't compare anybody to him. Uh, listen, uh, I bless his holy name. Uh, that's my God. Uh, he's an incomparable God. Uh, can I say, uh, he's not only the incomparable God, uh, he's the inconceivable God. Uh, hey, we can't even uh, uh, begin in our little pea brains to conceive uh, how great God is. Uh, he gave us some glimpses in the Word of God, uh, but the half hasn't been told. Uh, and neighbor, hang around. Uh, one of these days we'll get to see him as he is. Uh, what a God. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 11, 33, uh, all the depth uh, of the riches, uh, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, uh, how unsearchable are his judgments uh, and his ways past finding out. Uh, we can't find out how great he is. Uh, because it's inconceivable to our minds. Uh, Isaiah 40, 28 says, Hast thou not known? Uh, hast thou not heard? Uh, 
that the everlasting God, the Lord, uh, the creators of the ends of the earth fainted not, uh, neither is weary. Uh, there is no searching of his understanding. Uh, he's inconceivable. We can't even conceive how holy he is how righteous he is, how gracious he is, how merciful he is, how long-suffering he is, how wonderful he is. But let me say, he's all those things and so much more. Hey, he's the inconceivable God, but he let us know just enough. He gave me just enough grace to save me, just enough grace to sustain me, just enough grace to help me. But I, I got news. Uh, as much as he's dished out, uh, he's got much more in his bounty. Uh, hey, uh, he showed me just enough mercy, uh, just enough forgiveness, uh, just enough of how great he is uh, that I can stand and say, uh, hey, uh, oh, how great God is. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, hey, I bless his holy name. Uh, listen. I don't understand how the great God of glory who spins the earth on his axis and holds everything together in his hand. He's so big and so vast uh, that he measured the hollow out of the hollow of his hand the waters of the earth. Uh, he's that great, uh, but yet uh, he could come and take up his abode in somebody like me. That's past my finding out. I don't understand everything about the Bible, but I believe it all. Amen. And there's some things that I've come to understand. He's God Almighty. Yeah. Only God can do the things that God does. Amen. He's an incomparable God. He's the inconceivable God. But can I say he's an independent God? Yeah. Yeah. He's self-sustained. God doesn't need anybody or anything. Right. God took nothing and made everything. Say, how do you know that? Because the Bible said so. The Bible said, God said, let there, and then it was. Hmm? Uh, you say, you don't believe in the Big Bang Theory? Oh, yeah, I believe in it. I believe God said, and bang, it happened. Uh, you say, you don't believe the cosmos had an explosion, all this? Where did the cosmos come from? God. And if you study your Bible, you'll find God made the sun before he made light. Light doesn't come from the sun. Light comes from God. Uh, he, he is the independent God. He's self-sustained. Can I say everything needs something to be sustained but God? Mm. The Bible says in Isaiah 45, 5, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside, thee, beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. That Bible says that God, there's nobody near him or nobody around him. He's God. Uh, uh, everybody might have some idols they worship, but they're not God. He's God. Muhammad's not God. Buddha's not God. Confucius is confused. Are you listening? Uh, there's one God. And he's made up of three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Huh? They're all three in one. I don't understand that, Fred. When you figure that out, you explain it to me. Uh, I've been studying that book 50 years. I don't understand how you can have three persons uh, uh, that have separate, separate administrations, but they're one. Uh, but one thing I know, I believe it, because the Bible says it. Uh, and they all agree in one. What a blessing. Uh, I, I don't understand all that. Uh, but God, uh, who has none else beside us, uh, lets us know that he girded us. He made us. Uh, he uh, allowed us to be formed in the womb and born uh, and come and dwell on his footstool and breathe his air uh, and live in his realm down here uh, even though we didn't know him. Right. Right. Could I say, if we was God, we'd only create people that would love us. God created people and gave them a choice. They could love him and accept him. Or deny him and reject him. It didn't matter. And it doesn't change the fact that he's God. He's independent. He doesn't need people. Now, I know some of you like to say you're a hermit 
And you don't need anybody, but you do need people. That's why God uh, made other people. And you know, that's why God gave us the church. Because we need one another. But never, ever get it in your mind that God needs us. God don't need us. He just chooses to let us hang around. Uh, the Bible says in uh, uh, Romans eleven thirty six, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. You realize nothing could, 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 be, uh, uh, could even uh, 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 consist without him? Amen. Everything is by him, yeah. through him, and yeah. for him. You know God created everything to bring glory to him? Yeah. You know when a bird tweets, he's bringing glory to God? You know when a dog howls at the moon, he's bringing glory to God? Do you know when everything in nature does what it does, it's bringing glory to God, and he made man to bring glory to God, and only man is given a will to choose whether or not to do that. Brother Clint, I don't always bring glory to him, but I sure want to because he's been good to me. But uh, Colonel, even if I don't bring glory to him, it doesn't change the fact that he's God. Mm. He's the independent God. Can I say this? He's the imperative God. He's essential. We couldn't live without him. Uh, could I say the Bible says in Colossians 1 and 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Nothing consists without God. Nothing. Let me give you an example. This is an inanimate object. Would you not agree? That's solid. It's made of oak. Looks like it's screwed and glued together. Sturdy. It was in the old building. It's been here now going on 25 years. I don't know how old it is. Probably 40, 45 years old. It's still solid and everything. We'd say that's a solid piece of furniture. But what we don't understand is that this is made up of matter. And matter is made up of atoms. And atoms have electrons and protons and neutrons and all kinds of things. And they're spinning all the time. Do you know this thing is not in inanimate. It's actually spinning. It's moving. And what holds it together is something called gravity. That's what keeps it in place. You know, the only thing keeping you in place is gravity. But who keeps gravity in place? God. He holds everything together. Through and by Him does all things consist. If God took a second off, everything would implode. Huh? Can I say He's the essential God? It's imperative. We could not have our being without God. Huh? Hey, one of the things that's going to be horrible after the Lord takes His church out of here, the Holy Spirit goes with us, uh, and this world will be given over to total anarchy, uh, and the flesh will be able to do uh, whatever it desires to do without any obstruction from God. Uh, the only thing keeping total evil from taking over, even though it looks like it's taken over, uh, is the presence of God in this world. Uh, but when God checks out with us, uh, this place will be Jacob's time of trouble. No wonder it's called great tribulation. I'm glad I'm on, I'm on the right side of this thing. I'm glad I know him today. And I say he's the imperative God. Acts 17 26, 20, 28 says this, for in him we live and move and have our being. You know without God you couldn't get out of the bed. Uh, Without God, you wouldn't work properly. Do you ever think about what a, a miracle the human body is? How your fingers move the way they move. Somewhere your brain gets an impulse, tells your fingers to move, and they move. Uh, how your feet move, your joints move. Now, some of us, our joints don't move like they used to, but they're still moving. Uh, so how, do, how does all that happen? God we had the baby over the other day it's amazing where'd she learn this you hand her a baby doll the first thing she does is start giving it kisses who puts in the mind of a little girl to get a baby doll and start having motherly instincts God who changes those motherly instincts man Mm -hmm. uh, I'm telling you, he's the imperative God. 
He is essential to every fiber of everything around us. Without God, we'd be in a mess. Now, there's a push to do away with God. We don't want to do away with God. Amen. Hmm? And by the way, if I didn't believe that God existed, why would I fight so hard to do away with Him? Why, why would I want to do away with something that didn't exist? Hmm? I don't believe in the boogeyman. You don't see me having a campaign to get rid of the boogeyman. He doesn't exist. Huh? So, so why the push? Because when God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul, the very conscience of man knows there's a God. That's why missionaries have went to some of the deepest regions of the deepest jungles in this world, and when they get there, they find an indigenous people who are worshiping something. They have totem poles or something. They're worshiping something. Why? Because man knows there is somebody that created them that is worthy of their worship. That's why we send missionaries so they can find out who they're supposed to worship. His name is Jesus. Notice I said Jesus. I didn't say Muhammad, Buddha. I didn't even say Mary. By the way, Mary gave one command in the Bible. She said, this is my son Jesus. Whatsoever he saith, you do it. Uh, and can I say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Hmm? Uh, say, Who are we to worship? Jesus. Hmm? Mary was just the vessel God chose to allow Jesus to come into this world. But can I say, mother-child worship goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 10 in Babylon. It's always been a part of paganism. Always. And by the way, the little statues you see outside of Catholic churches, that's not Jesus and Mary. That's Semiramis and Tamas. It's just been carried on. But you see, when God woke up Peter... Out of that dream where he saw that sheet coming down with all different kinds of animals. Uh, and the Lord told him to rise and eat. And Peter kept arguing with the Lord like he always did. Uh, he said, not so, Lord. Uh, see, under the law, there were certain animals you weren't allowed to eat. But the Lord was telling Peter, uh, arise and eat. He, it wasn't about food. You see, uh, uh, the Lord had a chosen people called the Jews. And all that Peter and the early church was preaching to were Jews. But God was saying, you take the gospel to all peoples. Because God is no respecter of persons. About that time, there's a knock on the door, and there's some Greeks uh, came uh, to his door. And there was a Greek by the name of Cornelius. And he said, uh, Peter, Cornelius wants to see you. And these people had been worshiping, but they didn't know what they were worshiping. Uh, and Peter went and preached to them the gospel. Uh, and Cornelius and his whole house got saved. Uh, and the Holy Ghost fell on them like it did the apostles. Uh, and Peter realized the gospel was open to all people. Uh, why tell me all this, preacher? It's very important. Because Cornelius and them went back to where they came from. Greece, and Rome, all that area. They had one message, Brother Bob. Now they went to a pagan society and had one gospel message. And from that point till 321 A.D., 300 years after Christ, that message of salvation got intermingled with paganism. At 321, at the Council of Trent, we find that the Catholic Church was born. And then they spent the Dark Ages going throughout Europe and slaying anybody that didn't accept them. Now they will tell you today, you're either Catholic or you're Protestant. Nope, Protestants protested the Catholic Church. They came out of the Catholic Church. That's where you have your Methodists, your Presbyterians, your Episcopalians, your Lutherans. They all came out of the Catholic Church. No, we're, we're, we're Bible believers. We come from Jesus. Uh, we got our doctrine from the Lord. There was a church in the world 300 years before the Catholic Church ever showed up. Uh, 
and we're still here. They've tried to do away with us, but we're still here. Uh, and the reason you don't see history books from uh, our Baptist forefathers uh, uh, from a thousand years ago is because the Catholic Church did everything they could uh, uh, to burn them up and do away with them. Uh, but one thing I found, uh, uh, this imperative, uh, inexhaustible, uh, incomparable God uh, said the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Uh, we're still here preaching the same gospel. Uh, I point to the same God uh, worshiping the Lord uh, what, a, what a God we serve uh, hey let them uh, uh, try and do away with us uh, the church isn't going down she's going up one day uh, and I say blessed be the name of the Lord uh, say preacher I don't believe all that I got books if you want to see it all in print I got a whole library on it uh, but the greatest book you can ever read is this book because this won't tell you about man, it'll tell you about God. Uh, can I say he's not only the imperative and independent God, he's an inexhaustible God. Uh, can I say the Bible makes some things very clear about God. What he always was, he still is and will forever be. Huh? The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Uh, Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord, uh, I change not. Uh, uh, there are people wanting to change the Bible. They're wanting to change the way they worship. They want to change this and change that. I just want to stick with God. He don't change. Uh, when God changes, I'll change. Uh, but until then, I'm going to stick with the old time way because it still works. Uh, hey, uh, Psalms 100 verse Verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Psalms 121 verse 4, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He's inexhaustible. He never gets tired. He never gets worn out. He never changes his mind. Nothing has ever occurred to him. I said he's almighty God today. I bless his holy name. Can I say this? Uh, he's the indemnifying God. Say, so what does that mean? That means he's the redeeming God. See, God is holy. And God accepts nothing less than holiness. Uh-oh. I'm looking around there in a halo in a bunch. We all in trouble. That's why Jesus Christ came. He did what we couldn't do. He kept the law of God. And then he bled and died for our sin. And when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved, he redeems us. He buys us back to God. We who couldn't get to God. There's no bridge to get to heaven. There's no works to get you into heaven. The only way you can get to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to be redeemed from your sin. Uh, and then he does something uh, uh, tremendous. Uh, he takes up his abode in our heart and life. Uh, and then he robes us in his righteousness. Uh, and when God looks at me, he don't see filthy me. Uh, he don't see sinful me. Uh, he sees his darling son, the Lord Jesus. Uh, and God made a way to redeem you and I. Uh, he indemnified us uh, from everything we were guilty of. Uh, the Bible says in Isaiah 47 and 4, uh, As for our Redeemer, uh, the Lord of hosts is his name, uh, the Holy One of Israel. Uh, Galatians 3.13 says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law uh, being made a curse for us uh, for it is written cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree uh, Titus 2.14 says uh, who gave himself for us uh, that he might redeem us from all iniquity uh, and purify unto himself a peculiar people uh, zealous of good works uh, I don't work to get saved uh, I work because I am saved uh, and the Bible says in 1 Peter 1.18 uh, For as much as you know uh, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation uh, received by tradition from your fathers uh, you better be careful being uh, caught up in tradition. That won't redeem you. 
What will? I'm glad you asked. Uh, verse 19. Uh, but with the precious blood of Christ uh, as a lamb without blemish uh, and without spot. Uh, no wonder Revelation 5, 9 is in the book. Uh, and they sang a new song uh, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof. Uh, for thou wast slain uh, and hast redeemed us to God uh, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. What a God! I say, uh, that's our God, Almighty God. See, religion teaches you've got to give your son to their religion. And salvation says God sent his son for you and I. Uh, all you've got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He makes a way for sinners to be saved out of every nation tongue and kindred now this is a participating question right here I need to see a show of hands how many of you here are 100% Jewish anybody oh we're all in trouble under the law huh because God made a way for the Jews under the law but under grace Jews got to get saved like we are but aren't you glad God opened up the vine Israel and grafted in a branch called the church and made a way where all peoples could be saved Amen. how many people are German uh, descent anybody here German descent raise your hand don't be ashamed we got some Germans huh anybody in here uh, of Scottish descent that's me huh anybody here of English descent anybody here of Native American Indian descent anybody here of uh, 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 Spanish speaking Mexican descent anybody from Mexico uh, anybody here from Asia we got some Asians back here huh hey hey man uh, even though Jay says that he's a hillbilly uh, y'all come back he's he's the first hillbilly Asian I ever met uh, hey how many, how many from, from like uh, 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 Canada, Nova Scotia? Anybody there from there? Anybody from the Nordic places like uh, uh, Sweden, Norway, anybody like that? I got, got some, hey, isn't it a blessing? None of us could have been saved. Amen. But God made a way. Because yeah. he's a redeeming God. Yeah. He loved us with an everlasting love. We were his creation, and he had to make a way where old Gentile dogs like us could be saved. Amen. Made a way. Some of us are just mutts. We got a little bit of everything in us, huh? Huh? But God loves mutts. Made a way. Huh? He's the redeeming God. Uh, we couldn't save ourselves. Do you know the Bible teaches that we, in our lost condition, didn't even retain God in our knowledge? None of you even thought about God till somebody talked to you about God. Oh, yeah. Till somebody preached to you about God. Yeah. Till somebody left you a gospel tract. Somebody somehow introduced you to the fact that there is a God. Right. And God's the one that orchestrated all of that. Because yeah. God cares about you. And He loves you. And He wants to redeem you. He wants to redeem me. Aren't you glad God redeems? Amen. Now look at the family we're all part of. Amen. We all come from different places. But now we're part of the family of God. Uh, we all have the same lineage. His name is Christ. Isn't that a blessing? Matter of fact, in, in there in Matthew, when it starts talking about the lineage of Jesus, his, his earthly uh, uh, parents' his lineage gets down there, and, and it said this one begat that one. And then it, it, it talked about Jesus Christ. After that, I put Jesus begat me because he saved me third Saturday night of March, 1974, coming up on 50 years. Huh? Uh, what a God. He's a redeeming God. Aren't you glad somebody told you about Jesus? Amen. Aren't you glad for the day that you believed on the Lord Jesus? Huh? I know Brother Ron's testimony, he'd tell you, he, he, he wasn't a churchgoer. He didn't know nothing about God. Huh? And I imagine when you got saved, you didn't even know how to pray. You didn't know nothing about God. Aren't you glad it isn't in the prayer we pray? I've heard preachers say, if you didn't pray this, I don't even remember what I prayed. Huh? I don't even remember yesterday, let alone what I prayed 50 years ago. It's not about what we pray. It's about what we believe in our heart. 
Do we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will save us? Do we believe that he died for us, was buried and rose again? If you believe the good news of the gospel, Jesus saves, and you ask him to save you, he'll save you. Doesn't matter what you pray. It's what you, well, Lord, I must have saved me. Huh? All I remember is after he saved me, all I could do was say thank you. Thank you. Because the weight of the world had been lifted off me. And then I discovered a whole new world that I didn't know existed. See, I didn't know. Before I got saved, I was dead in trespasses and sin. I didn't know I was dead to God. But when I got saved, he raised me in newness of life, made a new creature out of me. Things started changing in my life. Uh, all because of what Jesus did. Because he's a redeeming God. I'm glad he don't leave us where he found us. Hmm? Uh, I'm looking around this crowd here. I remember how some of you all showed up. You don't look like that anymore. So what happened? Was it all that stern preaching? No, I don't preach on all that stuff. No, the Lord changes you. See, I'm a firm believer. God knows how to change people. He's a lot better at it than I'd ever be. Uh, I, I love telling this story. Embarrassing Brother Brian, but I love telling it. When they showed up the first time, I mean, they took up that whole back pew, and he was a mess. He was in short pants and a muscle shirt, had, had all kinds of things hanging off of his ears and face and everything. I mean, he was a mess. And I mean, they come walking out, I thought, what in the world has happened to us today? But what I did not know, he just got born again. He didn't know anything. Now look at him today. He's in a suit. I never did I ever tell you you had to wear a suit to come to church? No. But see, Jesus changed him. And all of a sudden, something inside him said, you know, I want to clean up a little bit. He started cleaning up a little bit. Now he's going over to the jail and telling all them over jail. He should be in jail, but he's not in jail because God saved him before he had to go to jail. And look at him, he goes over and tells them they can get saved too. Huh? Isn't that a blessing? Huh? Say, how'd that happen? Jesus. Because he's an indemnifying God. He redeems. He saves us from our sin. We were bound by the chains of sin. And we couldn't break them. But Jesus could. And all it took was us to believe that he'd save us. And put our trust in him. I got one other thing about Almighty God. I could be here all day. Can I say this? He's the inescapable God. Listen to me. You can reject him, but you'll never get away from him. If you die without him, you're going to have to face him. There's no way around it. Everybody's going to stand before God. You either stand before him saved at the judgment seat of Christ, or you'll stand before I'm lost at the great white throne judgment. The difference is those that stand before him saved, he'll not judge us for our sin because our sin was paid for by the blood of Christ. But he'll judge us for the works and the deeds done in our body after we were saved. But if you're lost without God, you'll stand before God and the books will be open and you'll be judged for every filthy, vile sin you ever committed. And you'll be sentenced to a place called the lake of fire where all eternity you'll pay for your own sins because you wouldn't let Jesus pay for them. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. We all got an appointment with death. Did you ever see a cow wear a wristwatch? Did you ever go to the zoo see a monkey wear a wristwatch? You know why animals don't wear wristwatches? They have no soul. You know why we keep a track of time? It's not so we can get somewhere on time. It's because we all have an appointment with death. You only got so many days on this face of this earth. We don't know what that number is, but God does. And you have an appointment with death, whether or not you realize it. And after death's the judgment. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God you know why we dread death because we're going to have to face God even saved people know they're going to have to face God for things they've said and done since they got saved but I'm glad for the child of God the sting of death's been removed and I'm glad when we get to that point he gives us dying grace and he just ushers us in to glory this morning 
I'm just trying to paint you a little picture about Almighty God. You can't compare anybody to him. You can't even really conceive of who he is. You know why God said not to make any graven image of him? Because man couldn't do him justice. You ever see a beautiful sunset? That's nothing compared to how beautiful God is. The Bible says he's altogether lovely. John goes on to write in this chapter, when he saw him, his hair was white as wool, his face uh, shined as brass, uh, his eyes were as flames of fire, his voice was as many thunder. He said, when I saw him, he said, I fell at his feet as a dead man. He was so glorious. We can't even conceive of how wonderful God is. He's inexhaustible. He's all-knowing, omnipresent, and all-powerful. Can I say this? He's an indemnifying God. He redeems sinners. Made a way where his creation could be restored to him. And can I say this? He's inescapable. We're all going to stand before God. Can I say? Heard Brother Raymond Sorrells preach probably 40 years ago. You better stand before God before you stand before God. You better come before him as a sinner and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner and accepting as Lord or Savior before you stand before him. Because one day you're going to stand before him. God help us to realize Almighty God, he don't need us, but he chooses to love us, and he chooses to bless us, and he chooses to use us for his glory. If you're saved, you ought to do everything you can to please Almighty God in serving. If you're here today and you're not saved, in a moment we're going to have an invitation. Just like you get an invitation to a wedding or an invitation to a party, we've got an invitation to something greater. We've got an invitation to heaven, and it comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have your sins forgiven today. All you've got to do is come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. You come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible, show you how to be saved. You can be saved today, have your sins washed away, and know God as your heavenly Father. You can have that today. Say, how do you know, preacher? Because that's how he saved me. That's how he saved anybody that's in here that's been saved. They came to the end of themselves and trusted in the Lord, and the Lord saved them. If you want to be saved, I've got good news. God wants to save you. And he said in, in no wise would he cast you out. He just says, come, come. He that is thirst, come, drink the water of life freely. Will you come today? Put your faith in the Lord. Child of God, when's the last time you just thought, man, how great God is? I don't deserve him, but I'm sure glad I have him. When was the last time you told him, thank you for saving me? When was the last time you told him, Lord, thank you for loving me? Thank you for being my God. When was the last time you just showed appreciation that Almighty God took notice of you? Today ought to be a day of thanksgiving and praise and worship to Almighty God. As Brother Clint and Brother Daniel come, let's all stand. Some are already making their way to the altar. If you need to be saved, why don't you come today? Our folks are coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. We love you for how good you are. We thank you, Lord, for caring about us and making a way for sinners to be saved. Lord, I'm glad you're no respecter of persons. Lord, if it took money to be saved, I'd have never gotten saved. If it took intelligence, I'd have never been saved. If it took uh, living in a certain area, I'd have never gotten saved. God, I'm glad you made a way where everybody could be saved. It's your will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, I pray there be anybody amongst us today who's unsaved, not ready to meet the Lord. I pray today would be the day of their salvation. God, I pray for saved folks. Lord, they just show a, a, a sign of appreciation by bowing their heads and letting you know how much they care about you and how thankful they are that, Lord, you looked their way and you saved them from their sin. Now, Lord, I pray you'd bless now in this invitation. God, I pray you'd speak to hearts. And I pray folks will do business with God. And Father, we'll not fail to bless you for what you do. For it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen.